In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. We began plotting a journey together two weeks ago when I shared with you the fact that I've been hearing more and more it's hard for people to find God in their lives. And I sketched out for you my ideas of four forks in the road that all Christians must follow and stay on that road and make the right turn if we're going to find God. Well, I heard something, maybe you heard this in the news this week. A research study came out from the Pew Research Institute, and it was quite sobering. It seems that we are not the only ones struggling to find God. In the early 1990s, now I know I'm not a little kid, I'm not young anymore, but I'm not an old, old man. But in the early 90s, I was well into my adulthood, and nine out of 10 Americans said, I'm a Christian. Nine out of 10 in the early 90s. Two years ago, year 2020, that number had dropped to 64%. Take that in for a second. One out of three Christians in the United States of America, over those last less than 30 years, left the Christian faith, left following Jesus Christ. Now, if you think it's because they've gone to other religions, it's not the case. Of all of the Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists, and all other religions in the United States of America, you add all of them up and they total 6%. So we haven't lost Christians in great numbers to other religions. Where did they go? They went to what researchers call the unaffiliated. We call them nuns, not N-U-N-S, not the ones that the women that live in the monastery, N-O-N-E-S. That when they're asked, what's your religious faith? None. None of the above, none at all. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why? Why would one out of three Americans that would call themselves Christians decide that that was not where they wanted to continue living? One thought that's out there is, well, it's getting harder. It's getting harder to be a Christian. Well, that may be true in the sense that the culture is not as supportive as it once was of our Christian faith. The morals of the culture have changed. That's true. But in terms of how hard it is to be a Christian, just think back in terms of Catholicism in the late 50s. There was no Saturday evening Mass. We could go and go and go to Mass and get home and have the whole day Sunday to yourself. There was Saturday evening vigil. Like we have Vespers prepare ourselves for the Sunday morning liturgy. They had that. So it hasn't become harder to be a Catholic. It's become much easier. If you were a Protestant during this time, you might remember a time in your lifetime where you went to church not just every Sunday, but twice on Sunday. Once in the morning, and then once again in the evening. And for many people, also on Wednesday evening. It's not gotten harder to be a Protestant, it's gotten easier. In many churches, you can grab your latte on the way into church. It's just the way it is. Now, we're not going to judge anyone else because pretty much every one of you is sitting on a padded pew. That didn't happen. Maybe it happened in the 50s in Orthodoxy, but not much before that. All Christians have done too much to make Christianity easier. And yet, what was the result? How did the experiment work out? Did it work out well for us? Not when one of three walked away. So an easier Christianity is not the answer. For this journey to God that I've laid out for you, the first one I said is that if Christ is not number one, everything we're going to take, all those other decisions after that, we're going to make wrong decisions. 
because we'll make them based on somebody or something else being number one, typically ourselves. So Christ has to come first. That's the first fork in the road. And last week I talked about if we're going to follow Christ, we have to follow the right one. There are lots of false Christs who put themselves out as saviors, not necessarily divine, but people who will make our lives better. But the most dangerous ones are the version of Christ that we have inside our own hearts and our own, our own minds. And last week we talked about the crucified Christ. That Christ is the Christ. He's the Christ that does not allow us easily to misunderstand him. If we think of him as judge first, as angry first, as distant first, all those things, it's because we haven't looked very long and hard at Christ crucified. And so last week we talked about the fork in the road is following the crucified Christ as the true Christ. And that leads us to this week's fork in the road. No less consequential to make this correct turn, this correct choice than the previous two. We actually began hearing about it not in this week's epistle, but in last week's. In last week's epistle, we heard St. Paul tell us, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, had we stopped there, we'd say, well, that was very informative of Christ as the crucified one. But St. Paul doesn't stop there. He says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, and listen carefully, through whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. My brothers and sisters, this is the next fork in the road if we're going to find our way to Christ. It's not just who is he, but who are we? And who are we as followers of him? I think too often we have this idea, we've got it from lots of different places and they're all wrong, that because he was crucified, because he suffered, now we get to sit back and enjoy the blessings that come from that. We could spend all day talking about the sources where we get that wrong idea. But it's a wrong idea. We think that because he was crucified, we go straight to the resurrection. But that's not the Christianity that he taught and calls us to live. It's actually the wrong way. And if you, in your mind, in your heart, believe that, I'm not here to blame you or to make you feel bad. I'm here to say to you that that was a wrong turn. So what's the right turn? How do we navigate this next fork in the road? We actually heard about it also in today's epistle, where St. Paul says a very similar thing as we heard him say last week. Listen carefully to what he says. I have been crucified with Christ. St. Paul talking. Nevertheless, I live, yet not yet I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Another idea that to follow Christ means that we are crucified with him. You don't see us up there. It's not a literal indication that we are crucified in the same time and place and manner that he was crucified. But St. Paul tells us that he was crucified with Christ. And my brothers and sisters, if we are going to follow the path that leads to God, we have to do the same. His crucifixion does not remove the need for our crucifixion. His crucifixion requires our crucifixion if we were going to follow him as he invites us to. If we don't think this is the standard, all you have to do is look around. We don't put icons up on the walls of the church to say, this is somebody who took it easy. This is somebody who just celebrated Christ's victory and sat back and said, oh, good for him. I'll have some of that. Every story of every face in every icon is the face of a life lived as one crucified. Not on our own to save the world. We don't have to do that. That was done. 
But if we were going to believe in the Christianity that St. Paul teaches, then his being crucified means not that we are not, but that we need also be the ones to crucify ourselves. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Before I get there, I want to share with you, it's not just St. Paul. We heard in today's gospel, the Lord said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There are no words that I could relate to you that more clearly state not what Father Michael's opinion is, not what just different saints and fathers of the church teach, what Jesus Christ himself told us from his own mouth. The same mouth that tasted the vinegar on the cross uttered these words. And he told us, if you want to come after me, you have to do what I do. You must take up your cross as I took up mine, he tells us. And this is where really we are having a tough time. Because as the saints show us by their example, and as Jesus' words tell us crystal clearly, there is no true Christianity that is not a crucified Christianity. If we're going to be Christians, it's because we are crucified Christians. We heard Jesus tell us that himself. And that's where it gets a little hard for us. Because of the world changes in some ways, in some ways, there's nothing really new. If there's something new, it's that you and I all live, and I've shared with this with you before, relatively easy lives. Every single one of us live, rel live relatively easy lives. And when we don't, this is the important part, when we begin to suffer, whether it be a physical illness emotional difficulties, relational difficulties, financial difficulties, whatever that happens to be, and most especially spiritual difficulties. What do we typically do? We run away from the pain, away from the suffering, away from our crucifixion. I stand before you wearing a cross. Many of you are wearing your own cross today. We make the sign of the cross all the time. And yet somehow we think that our crosses are going to come without suffering. Or sometimes we think our crosses are just so hard, if we only had a different cross, life would be so much better. I could be so faithful. Why do I have to suffer in the way I have to suffer? There's a story about this, and those of you that have been to the Antioch Village probably heard this several times. It's a powerful story. There's a man who suffered in his life. We don't know what kind of suffering he had. But in his own mind, he was suffering greatly, and so he prayed over and over again, God, spare me. Spare me the suffering. And in a dream one night in his sleep, Christ came to him. And he said, I've heard your prayer, and I'm going to answer it. Bring the cross of your suffering and follow me. And in his dream, the man follows Jesus to a room. And the door is closed. And Jesus tells the man, put your cross down and enter the room. The man puts his cross down, the symbol of his suffering, enters the room, and it's a large and vast room. Goes on seemingly forever, and all over the place, cross after cross after cross. Big ones. Small ones, beautiful ones, rough, prickly ones made of thorns and rough wood, rusting metal crosses and beautiful gold crosses. And off to the side, a man sees a nice, beautiful, golden cross without any blemish at all. And he's so excited. This is the cross I want. And he takes the cross and he says, Lord, I'll take this one. And in the context of all of the crosses, Jesus says to him, that's the same one that you left at the door. You and I think sometimes if we suffer that we're suffering so hard, 
If only we suffered in a, in a less difficult way or in another way. And so we try to avoid the suffering. And Jesus invites us not to avoid it, but as he told us today, to pick up our cross. So what does it mean? What does it mean to follow the crucified Christ and accept the fact that we are called to be crucified Christians? Well, he told us three steps. The first is denying ourselves. And let's face it, we're not very good at that. Denying ourselves is going to require suffering. What do we do when we don't deny ourselves? We give to ourselves. We supply ourselves. We lavish ourselves. And that's really easy. And in some ways, we might call it wonderful. But when suffering comes to us and we deny, we don't deny our suffering, we deny it, we deny our luxury. We don't deny our luxury, excuse me then we're not embracing our suffering. How do we deny ourselves by not denying ourselves? That's the first step. And in whatever way we're suffering, in whatever manner, to whatever degree, embrace it. Embrace it in the way that, go back to last week's fork in the road, we can embrace it loved by a God who loved us first. We can do that. We can put our faith in him. We can have him, in fact, Help us carry our crosses. And the second part is to be ready not just to deny ourselves, but to take it up. To choose that hard way. Even when we have a choice. We could walk away from it, or we could pick it up and choose it as our own. You know, the cross of Christ did not come with only physical suffering. That cross was a cross of shame. Because of our delicateness, we clothe Christ in his icon. That's not how he was crucified. And he was there to be shamed, publicly lifted up for his crimes, of which he was guilty of nothing. And yet you and I, sometimes when anybody hints at us doing something that we didn't do, oh, don't you accuse me of that. i got to stand up for myself and how we defend ourselves. Taking up our cross means choosing the difficult way, even if that means somebody else's blame, and even if it's wrong. That's what it means to fully take up a cross. And then he tells us, once we deny ourselves and take up our cross, to follow him. Follow him where? Where he goes. Yes, into death and out into life again. But follow him the path of love. It was love that took him to the cross and love that will take us to do all the things that God is calling us to do in sacrifice. Why don't we do it? Well, somehow for us it just seems so bad. Seems so wrong, seems so negative to sacrifice and struggle and to give. Well, if we're gonna be Christians and stay Christians and not join the rest, the same research study says that in a decade or two at the most, if you are a Christian in the United States of America, you will be the minority. A decade or two, I think the first prediction is probably more likely. But if we're going to stay Christians, it's going to be because we don't see this Christian life of being crucified as negative, as wrong, or as bad. We don't call... Good Friday, Good Friday. We call it Great and Holy Friday. We sorrow for our Lord who suffered for us, but we don't denigrate his way. We imitate his way. We follow him, and we say to ourselves, in whatever way, in whatever crosses come our way, that's the cross I'll pick up, and he'll help me. And there's no cross that I will be asked to pick up that he will not carry with me. The way of the cross is not depressing. It's not doom and gloom. You're going to hear me say in just a few minutes as we're sensing before the great entrance, for lo, through the cross has joy, joy come into all the world. And you and I have waited long enough for joy to come by our luxury, by the next car and the clothes and the house and all those things that we think bring us joy. They bring us temporary happiness 
and then we're burdened by them. That's the wrong way. The only true way to find true joy is through not just Christ's cross, but you and I picking up our own. Right after the part of the gospel I already quoted for you, Jesus goes on, whoever would save his life will lose it. How many of us are trying so hard to save our lives, to save enough money, to get enough comfort, all the things that all of us do? If you don't think you're following the path of comfort, sit down with me and I'll share with you how I too have fallen into this terrible path. And it's a lie, but we keep following it. We want to save ourselves. And Jesus says, if you would save your life, you'll lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. You want to find God? You want to be not just happy, but joyful? Take the path that Christ invites us to this morning. Lose our lives for his sake and the gospels. And that's how we're going to find it and save it. My brothers and sisters, this is not an optional fork in the road. It's not the kind where we can turn back and go, you know what, I really don't like this, I'm going to go back. And it's especially not, in reality, the kind of fork that we can pretend doesn't exist. That would be the worst thing we could do, to pretend that we can make another choice. And it's all fine. To do that is to call Christ a liar for the things we heard out of his mouth today. So this is not a choice we can avoid. And in fact, it's a choice that leads to him. What better choice could there be than the choosing of something that leads to God, the source of all goodness and life and peace and real joy? It's good news. The way of the cross is not bad news. It's good news. So before we leave church this morning, we are going to sing a hymn that we sing every time we celebrate a feast of the cross. We have the cross here adorned in the center of the church. And we're going to sing, Before thy cross I bow down and worship. We're not idolaters. We're not bowing down to the wood of the cross. We're bowing down to Christ and the way of Christ that every single one of us is called to. So I hope today when we do that, when we bow down before the cross, that will be a recommitment and a re-understanding of what it means to be a Christian and to find God. And then in every way we're making a wrong turn, we back up and we turn the correct path and we follow the way to Christ. That way to Christ goes through not only his cross, it goes through ours. And it's the way of joy. I hope that we will bow down and elevate his way above our own. I hope that we'll mean it and that traveling that path, we're going to find the God who is calling for us to find him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.